Let's go ahead and stand, and we're going to read John chapter 11, John chapter 11, and we're going to begin in verse 17 and read through verse 43, John chapter 11. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, there should be one around you, the black one, and on, we'll be on page uh, 897 in that Bible. And so let me begin. Now, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for days. Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come uh, to Martha and Mary to console them uh, concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, shall yet he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into this world. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, The teacher is here, and he's calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. Verse 31, When the Jews, who also were in the house, uh, consoling her, uh, Mary rose quickly and to go out. And they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said to her, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, a stone laid against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone, Martha. Uh, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you if you believe you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this on account of the people standing around so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus. Come out. And the man who had died came out. His hands and feet were bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with cloth. And Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Verse 45. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and seen what he did, believed in him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this story. The story points to you being the resurrection and the life. And those who believe in that shall never die. Lord, I pray that every person in here hears that and believes that this morning. That when they walk out those doors, they believe that you are the resurrection and the life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys, go ahead and have a seat. So we'll be, I thought we might be finishing up John 11, but I'm going to actually keep this, the, the ending portion for next week's sermon as we're in this transition period in the book of John. If you're visiting with us, we go through books of the Bible, line by line, verse by verse, and we're currently obviously in the book of John, and we have reached the pinnacle of John of gospel. John chapter 11, the resurrection of Lazarus. We, we see that we have arrived at a funeral, and it's like a funeral that would be unlike any other funeral that would probably exist in the history of the world, this raising of Lazarus. It is unique. It is unexpected, especially for those who are there. 
So with that in mind, I, I decided to type in what are unique funerals that may have happened that we are unaware of? Um, uh, what, what, what are some unexpected funerals as you walk in, all of a sudden, you're like, whoa, okay, that's a little bit different, right? Well, um, let's just say there's, <laughs> there's some crazies out there and <laughs> some of this stuff, man. Um, um, there was this one that um, uh, the, you walk in and the coffin was duct taped from head to toe. And um, they walked in and they're like, whoa, 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 why, why, why is the coffin duct tape? Because it was the husband, the wife uh, said, because I didn't want that creep to get out, right? You're like, whoa, okay. I don't know if that says something about him or something about you, right? Maybe he's glad he's dead so he can't get out if he lived with someone like that. I don't know. Uh, there's another thing that seems to be a trend these days, that the deceased attend their own funeral. And what I mean by that is that uh, the people create a life scenario that this person would live. That would be part of their life. This would be something that they would do. For instance, one of them came in and there was an ambulance because he was an EMT, so he was dressed up in his EMT guard sitting in the driver's seat of the ambulance as the people walked in. That would be kind of weird, right? There was another one where this guy loved to play poker. So they literally set this guy up with some sunglasses, put cards in his hand, and they sat around and played poker as the gathering. Can you imagine that? Um, you know, the guys were, were having trouble reading him because he had a pretty good poker face at that time, right? It was pretty, pretty <laughs> stiff and straight, right? I mean, you can't make this stuff up. This is like some weird stuff. It's creepy. I was going to show you some pictures, but... I was like, I was too wigged out, and I didn't want you guys to start seeing dead people, right, in this place. So, anyways, well, those attending Lazarus' funeral, they would experience something that they would never forget. And what they would experience would be Jesus' power and authority over sin and death. And though death brings sadness, it, uh, it brings um, grief, it is not the end. That's what we see today, that the, death is not the end. There's a resurrection in life to be, believed, to be believed in, to be rejoiced in, and to be experienced today. And so let's dive into John chapter 11. It might be a familiar passage to you, but I'm asking you to put yourself in that place back some 2,000 years ago. First, we see Jesus comforts Mary, uh, Martha. Jesus comforts Martha in verse 17 uh, through 27. Uh, first, 17. Now, when Jesus came, he found Lazarus. And he had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. And many of the Jews had come to Mary, uh, Martha to console them concerning their brother. If you were with us last week, you understand the, the scenario, the scene. Um, uh, Lazarus is a, is a man that Jesus loved, but he's sick. Uh, an unexpected illness has taken over. So Mary and Martha, the two sisters that are caring for their brother, send for Jesus. He's not around. They, they send for him because they know that Lazarus is sick and that Jesus could heal them. So they send for him. And the messenger gets to Jesus, but Jesus delays. He says this sickness will not lead to death, so he doesn't come immediately. And we saw last week that uh, the reason why Jesus does that is first and foremost to display the glory of God. He's going to put on the display of the glory of God. Secondly, he delays because he wants to produce something in, in the sisters. He wants to produce something in the, in the people there that are surrounding and attending to Lazarus. He wants to produce faith in them. And then third, we see that even though it may look like Jesus was late, we saw that Jesus is always on time. And, and when dealing with sickness and suffering and grief, Jesus is never late. He always shows up with perfect timing, sometimes our timing is just a little bit early. So this is what we see in verse 17. The delay is over. Jesus now arrives in Bethany to see and find that Lazarus has already been dead for four days and in the tomb. And we'll see why that four days is so significant in verse 39. So when Jesus arrives, there are a lot of family and a lot of friends and a lot of acquaintances there to console Mary and Martha. And rightly so. This is the norm, right? Lazarus was an awesome dude. He was well-loved and well-liked in his community. So, of course, there were going to be a lot of people that would be attending Mary and Martha in their grieving process. So Martha hears that Jesus is coming. In verse 20, she says that um, she heard Jesus was here and she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed at home. 
Now word gets to Martha again that he's coming. And this is no surprise to us, shock for us, that, that Martha is the one that gets up and runs out, right? She's the go-getter of the sisters. She's the one that can't sit still. She's always working. She's always doing something. And so here we see that, that Martha initiates and rushes out to Jesus. And Mary, her sister, stays at the house. Verse 21, we see Martha and see what she says to Jesus. Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Now the immediate question is to us is how do we take those statements? How do we read those statements? Now some commentators read them that, that Martha is angry with Jesus. And then she's rebuking Jesus. It, it, it's something along these lines. Like Jesus, uh, the Lazarus, your, your friend, your pal, your buddy, the one that you loved, uh, we sent for you because we know that you could heal him. But you didn't come. In fact, I know that our messenger got to you because he came back and reported to me that when he told you, you just said, meh, this doesn't lead to death. And you didn't come, but you stayed. Um, wrong Jesus. It did lead to death. My brother is dead. So some read this as a, as a rebuke. And I think they could. I don't think that'd be that off. But I take it with others said. That, sure, there's a little bit of bite to Martha's question. There's a, there's a little bit of saltiness in her statement, but I don't think it flows from a, a rebuke or anger as much as it flows from a heart overwhelmed with grief, overwhelmed with confusion, overwhelmed with sadness. You've got to remember, this death was not a chronic illness. And, and typically, those that are in the, in the medical field, when, when something comes on to a, a, a person that's generally healthy, um, this illness is usually devastating. It's, it's almost violent, right? You see this healthy person just deteriorating before your eyes quickly, and you don't know what to do. So we can kind of see the reason why she's perplexed. Um, so I read this more in the sense of she's stunned. Um, I, I read it with this tone. Martha said to Jesus, uh, Lord, if you would have been here... Uh, my brother would not have died. Uh, but also, I know that whenever you ask from God, God will give you. There's a, there's a confusion going on. There's a wrestling in our heart. Um, and, we, and we know this experience with grief and suffering. If, if you ever had a loved one die, someone close to you, you know there's times of, of frustration, of being stunned, of why is this happening, this confusion, this questioning that's going on in your heart. At the same time, all of a sudden, like, yeah, but I'm a Christian, so... Yeah, Lord, whatever I ask, I know you will do. There's this confusion that's happening in Martha, and I think that's what is happening here. Her heart is gripped by sadness and grief and not anger. And so she, she has these statements. And what I love is, is I love Jesus' response to Martha. He doesn't rebuke her, but he comforts her. And how does he comfort her? He comforts her with an intellectual, theological statement. He, he comforts her with doctrine. This is, he, he, he knows Martha. He knows how she thinks. He, he knows how she operates. He knows her personality because he's walked with life with her for the last couple of years. And so he knows exactly what would comfort her in this time, and he comforts her with the scriptures. He shares truth with her. God's word. And again, I think he says this statement gently in verse 23. Jesus said to her, Martha, your brother will rise again. And I love Martha because she has the personality, again, as we know, that she's always got to say something, right? Anyway, you guys know what I'm talking about? You know that person? Heck, some of you are that person, right? And I know, I know I'm that person. I know when someone tries to comfort me and they give me these words of encouragement and comfort and, 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 and they give me, and, and instead of just saying, yes, thank you, I say, well, yeah, but, right? Who else has that kind of problem in here, right? Yeah, there's a couple of us in here. And Martha says to him, I, I, I know Jesus, right? You know, I know Jesus. He will rise again in the resurrection. You're like, hey, 
Good job, Martha. You know, uh, way to teach the creator of the universe on his theology. Awesome job. You, you, know, you know your Bible. That's good. And, and it is good. It is good that she knows her Bible. This, this statement is true. And, and she knows this. This comforts her soul. And, and the majority of the Jews back then uh, would believe this, uh, in particular the Pharisees that taught this. They believed that there would be a resurrection via the Old Testament. They would probably be thinking of, of chapters like Daniel chapter 12, at the end of Daniel chapter 12, where it says there's going to be an end time. There's going to be a, 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 a resurrection. Some are going to go to everlasting life, and others are going to go to as everlasting contempt. And so Yeah, she gets it, it would seem. But look how Jesus responds. He says in verse 25, And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. This is the fifth I am statement that Jesus is making in the Gospel of John. We know that there's seven. And if we want to, we could divide the the Gospel of John by these I am statements. These are statements in which when Jesus says I am, he's claiming to be what? He's claiming to be God the Father. He's taking the very name of God that we saw in Exodus chapter 3 when Moses said to the burning bush, Who shall I say sent me to deliver Israel out of Egypt? And God the Father said, I am sent you. So Jesus is claiming to be God. So in other words, Jesus comforts Mary by bringing a a clarity to our understanding of the resurrection, a a, a deeper understanding, a right understanding, a fuller understanding of what she knows about the resurrection. She thinks, like all of us think, that the resurrection is the event that's going to happen in the future. And it is, but the reason why it is, Jesus says, is because he is the resurrection and the life. You see, first, the resurrection and the life is not about an event Jesus says, it's about me. It's about a person. I am the one that holds resurrection power. I am the one that holds life into my hands. I'm the one that says who lives and who dies. It's called the aseity of God. He is the one in which life flows out of him. Yes, it's an event, but the reason why there is an event, because there is one who holds the power, and that is Jesus. And what he's saying is here, Martha, you believe in a a future day, a future resurrection. Well, guess what, Martha? That day is now. Today is that day. You don't have to wait. You don't have to have the hope and wait for that hope and that peace to be realized. You could have and experience that resurrection life today. It's here. I am that day. The resurrection of the dead is more than an event. It is the person, the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And the resurrection, the life, is Jesus. That's why he says, I am the resurrection and the life. And then Jesus says something that should bring us all incredible hope and peace. Look at verse 25. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and life. Whoever believes in me, though he or she dies, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And Martha shows her faith that she does believe by giving one of the great statements of who Jesus is. Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ the Savior, the Redeemer, the Son of God, the very Son of God who is coming into this world. The resurrection and the life is yours, just like it was given to Martha, if you what? If you believe. If you believe this morning. I want to, think, I want to talk real quick because about death and life and, and kind of what it means, because in our culture, when we talk about death, um, we talk about it as no life, right? When we think about death, someone dies, we're like, they die, there's no life in them. And we can understand that because we're, 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 you know, have this worldview of this physical death. But the biblical worldview, that's, that's insufficient. In fact, it's not quite right. If we have a biblical view of death, as Jesus says here, he says, if you believe in me, though he dies, yet shall he live. So in essence, death doesn't mean no life. Death means something else. Those who believe in him really don't die. Everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die, Jesus says. So it's inaccurate to kind of say that someone is dead, according to Scripture. A a more biblical view is this. And this is why I love to do Christian funerals. As a, you know, as a pastor, obviously, we do some funerals. And there's definitely a distinction between those who believe in Jesus and the life and the resurrection and those who don't. 
And I love saying the Christian funerals, yes, there's grief, yes, there's sorrow, but there's also a joy there. There's also a confidence that the person in that casket is not really dead. Though physically dead, but not dead. There's that we know that they are not here, right? Their address has changed from an earthly, physical address to a spiritual, heavenly address. They are alive and well. Death is not the end. It is the beginning to eternal life. So death is not the end. It's a door. It's a place in which we walk through to eternal life. Death is not the end, but it is the beginning. So when we see a a Christian, a believer, one who has repented of their sins and trusted in Christ alone, we know that that person who died has an address change, has had maybe a promotion, so to speak. They are very much alive. They're just not with us physically. They're with the Lord in heaven, and they are waiting for us to come to them. So it's inaccurate to say and think about the biblical ends when someone dies that there is no life. No, there is life, Jesus says. Everyone who believes, though he dies, shall live. So this is how Jesus comforts Martha. He comforts her with the scriptures, with the theological truth that he is the Messiah, that he is the Christ, that he has come to save. I am the resurrection and the life. Secondly, we then see he moves on to Mary. In verses 28, Jesus comforts Mary. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house were consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep. Verse 32, now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. And so what we see here is John gives us two contrasts. He contrasts his two sisters, their personalities and how they respond to Jesus. We see here that that Martha, she, she took the initiative. She ran out to Jesus where Mary just waited back for the teacher to call her. Uh, We also notice that when when Mary gets to Jesus, what does she do? She falls down at Jesus' feet. This is an act of worship. But we don't see that with Martha. She's she's standing. She's ready to have a conversation with Jesus. And then we also see that when Mary also gets to Jesus, she's what? She's weeping. And we don't see that in the context with, with Martha, at least at the time where she met with Jesus. So we see that there's a contrast in the ways in which Mary and Martha are responding to Jesus. Neither one is wrong and neither one is right. They're both just responding the way that they know how. And then we also see they say the same exact thing, though. Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. Now, that shouldn't take us by surprise, right? Because probably in the moment when Lazarus was still alive and they were attending to him, they were saying to one another, man, I wish Jesus was here. He could heal him. You know, saying that back and forth. And so when the time comes, again, I believe out of a grieving heart, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. There's, there's a faith behind that statement. And then we see how Jesus responds to Mary. She, uh, Jesus responds to Mary differently Then he responds to Martha. Because of Martha's personality, Jesus responded to to her with with Scripture, with truth, got down to the the skinny, got got, got down to the black and white, right now, right now. That's Martha's personality. Mary is a different beast altogether. Verse 33, when Jesus saw her weeping, the Jews had come with her also weeping. He was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said, Lord, come and see And it says that Jesus, what? He wept. We know this is the shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. Does that maybe strike you at first as odd? That Jesus wept? Remember in the beginning he says, hey, this this death doesn't, this sickness doesn't lead to death. Jesus knows when he comes to the tomb what he's about to do. He's, he knows in a couple minutes, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to raise Lazarus from the dead. So, so why does he weep? Do you ever ask your question, why is he weeping? Why, why, why doesn't he just say, hey, Mary, it, it, it's okay. 
You know, I'm going to have some people move the stone, and as soon as they move the stone, and then at that point, I'm going to raise your brother. So, so stop crying. You don't, you don't need to cry. You don't need to weep. But he is weeping. And why is he weeping? Because as we see Jesus engage Martha with her personality and comforts her with a theological answer, he meets Mary in his humanity with the compassion of a broken heart. He doesn't comfort her with his deity like Martha, I am the resurrection and life, but in his humanity, he expresses compassion through tears and a broken spirit. He weeps with her. Charles Spurgeon says this about this, 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 this verse, 35. He actually preached two verses on just Jesus wept. He says, you just can't read this verse. You have to feel it. And so in this moment, we have to feel Jesus weeping. He's broke. He's hurting. His friend Lazarus is dead. His sisters are grieving. So he enters in with them. The reason why Jesus didn't say, hey, stop, stop, stop it right now. I'm going to raise him. is because he wanted to connect with them and with us as our high priest. He, he wanted to connect with us as a human savior at this moment. You see, Jesus is not some distant, cold Savior that's running this world. He's a close, intimate Savior. He's your Savior. He's my Savior. He knows every hair on your head. He's intimately acquainted with you and me and how we are wired because he is the one that knit us in our mother's womb. So therefore, he enters in with Mary and consoles her as a human Savior. He meets her there because there are times in our lives where we don't need a theological discourse. We just need a Savior who empathizes with us, who enters into our brokenness. And that's what Jesus does. He enters into Mary's brokenness. He, com he comforts her with a weeping heart. And that's a very, as we look at how Jesus responds to Martha and how he responds to Mary, it's a real simple and, and a real practical principle for us to exercise when we walk through grief with people. Some of you right now are going through some tremendous suffering. It might not be death, but there's other ways in which we suffer. And we need to be comforted by Jesus. And, and sometimes we need to hear the, the theological truths that are in this book, right? We need to hear and see our Savior as the Messiah, the Christ, the Savior. The one who spoke in this world was created with that power, with that truth. We need to be comforted by the Scriptures. Like in Psalm 19, where it says that the precepts of the Lord are right. And what do they do? They rejoice the heart. Some of you have a sorrowful heart right now. What you need to hear is you need to hear God's love through you, to you through his word, through his scriptures. You're walking through a circumstance that seems bleak and with no hope. And you need to hear God's word that says, man, I love you. And I'm going to cause all things together for your good. And that's what you need to hold on to. The winds and the, the storm of trials are, are blasting against you right now. And you need to, to hear that your foundation, what your life is built on, is the rock of Jesus and his word. And then there's others in here that, that you know the theological truth, but what you need right now is you just need someone to get in the mud puddle with you, right? Right? You just need someone to get into that, that trial with you. Where Romans 12 says, to weep with those who weep. Uh, you just need someone to come in and, and, and give you a hug, right? Hold your hand. Just let that person know, hey, I am here with you. We need to feel a presence. We need to feel a friend who is with us. And this is what Jesus does. He understands who 
in the time that he's meeting with and the, and the grief that they're going through. He understands Martha is built and wired a certain way, so he ministers to that way. And then he knows Mary, and she's wired and built a certain way, so he ministers to her in that way. But here's the thing. There's not only one way. Even those of us that are like Martha, that have like maybe an A-type personality and just want to hear the truth, sometimes we just, we just need a hug, right? Sometimes... I need a hug. I know it's hard to believe for some of you guys, but I just need my wife to come and give me a hug and say, it's going to be all right, Aaron. I'm with you. And there's other times where those that just need a hug, they need to to hear the truth of the God's word and who Jesus is. You see, suffering, death, all the different ways in which sin comes at us and hurts us and living in the Genesis 3 world, there's a there's a myriad of different ways in how we grieve, right? I mean, we read the books. There's some say there's five, uh, five uh, steps to grief. Some say there's seven. Some say there's 12. Um, let's, just, let's just think of grief as a big bowl of spaghetti, right? It's just all there. It's all intertwined to one another. It, there's never one clear way, right, when dealing with trials and grief. There's all different kinds. And so here Jesus says, hey, here's two ways in which I'm going to enter in as the Savior. Some, sometimes I'm going to meet you in your suffering as the Messiah, as the Christ, as the Lord of your life. And sometimes I'm going to come and meet you as your friend. And that's good wisdom and words for us this morning on how to meet others in their grief. Thirdly, let's see how Jesus comforts Lazarus. Verse 38. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. And it was a cave and a stone laid against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. And Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, But Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead for four days. Now this is the second time uh, in verse 39 we see that um, John has talked about uh, Lazarus being dead for how many days? Four days. Now this is vitally important. Remember, details matter when we go through the scriptures and look at this narrative. Because what John is saying here is he's erasing all doubt That Lazarus is not dead and just needs resuscitated, right? Oh, he just needs to be revived. No, four days is is very specific and important because it proves that Lazarus was dead. And what Jesus did was raise a dead man from the grave. In fact, it's important for two two reasons to prove the resurrection. One, there was a belief among the Jews at that time, and the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the scribes, this is what what they taught, is that that, um, during three days, the first three days if someone died, that the Spirit would actually be hovering over the body. Uh, The Spirit wouldn't leave. It it wouldn't be in the body, but it would just be kind of hovering, trying to re-enter the body. This is what they taught. This is what they believed, the culture back then. But on the fourth day... It was over. The Spirit left and went to the heavenlies. That's what they thought. That's what they believed. And so when it says that that my brother's been dead for four days, they're rebutting the culture saying that he is really dead. He's he's dead dead. And he's not like mostly dead, right? He's he's dead dead. Again, Prince of Bride, right? Uh, Miracle Max would say, hey, they already went through his, you know, his, his pants and his jacket pocket looking for change, right? That's how dead he is, right? He's dead dead. So that's one reason. The second reason why is... We know that he's dead is because he started to deteriorate. Uh, Martha said, hey, there's going to be an odor. We, we removed that tomb. Um, his body already started to deteriorate. It's going to stink. In fact, this is where you might want to read the King James Version because it actually gives a little bit uh, a better description. It says that uh, by this time, uh, the, my brother will stinketh, Right? He's going to stinketh. That's, that's, that's a good time to read the King James Version, all right? And so what, again, this, this important, these four days, is what they're saying is he's not just mostly dead. He's dead dead. It's not a resuscitation. This is a resurrection. Now also, I want to take, take a quick peek back at verse 22 with Martha in her second statement. Lord, if you would have been here, um, you know, my brother would be alive. But it says in verse 22, but even now I know that whatever you ask from God, he will give you. And and this seems to be a statement of faith, right? Um, Well, let's see how that pans out in her life. Now look at verse 39. Again, Jesus said, take away the stone. But Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor. He'll stinketh. 
for he's been dead for four days. What, does that sound like a statement of faith? Hey, whatever you ask, Lord, I know that you can do. Move the stone. Whoa, 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 whoa. What, what do you mean move the stone? He's dead. It's over. Her faith is limited at that point. And look at verse 40. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believe, you would see the glory of God? Martha's faith in Jesus was there. It just wasn't complete. We see that Martha's faith is coupled with what? Doubt. It's coupled with doubt. And that should bring all of us a comfort this morning, shouldn't it? That we can be honest with Martha. When we're walking through trials such as a death in the family, Jesus isn't looking for perfect faith. He's just looking for a little faith and believing in who he is for him to act. He doesn't need perfect faith. Notice he doesn't rebuke her. He doesn't say, Martha, remember back in, you know, a couple minutes ago when we were talking, you said, hey, whatever you ask, I believe that you can do. Well, I'm asking you to move stone. You're like, whoa, you don't believe. So therefore, I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to raise your brother from the dead. Have a good day. He doesn't say that, does he? No. Instead, he wants to build her faith all the more. And isn't it comforting that Jesus doesn't act by our faith? He acts by his mercy, his grace, his love for you and for me. Since you don't believe, I'm not going to raise him. No, he doesn't say that. In fact, he does the opposite. Because you doubt, I'm going to show you how much more I even love you that I'm going to raise him anyway. Because it doesn't depend on your faith. It depends on my power and my love for you. We sang the song uh, a couple minutes ago. He shall hold us fast. Fast. He shall hold us fast. For my Savior loves me so, he shall hold us fast. You see, when we go through trials, when we go through times of grief, it doesn't depend on how tightly we hold on to Jesus, though we should. What it depends on is how tightly Jesus is holding on to you and to me. That's where the hope is. Because if it was left up to us, we would be Martha. He's dead. Don't roll away the stone. He stinketh. Right? So take courage in that. Romans chapter 8 says this, talking about God's love for us in these midst of times and trials where it says this. What can separate us from the love of God? It says, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor anything else in all creation, even your doubt, even my doubt in what Jesus can do, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Isn't that beautiful? Doesn't that bring you hope right now? That if you are suffering, that your suffering, whether Jesus is going to bless you or not, does not depend on your faith, but on his goodness and love and mercy towards you, brings me incredible faith. We go on. Let's go back to verse 38. And I want us again to put us and try to put our thoughts, our mind there with, with Jesus and Lazarus and Mary and Martha in the tomb because this is an incredibly intense scene, an emotional scene. Um, it says in 38 that Jesus is what? Deeply moved again as he comes to the tomb. We saw in verse 33 it says that Jesus was greatly moved and troubled. That word trouble could mean angry or agitated. So here is Jesus. He sees what's happening, and he has a righteous anger that starts to bubble up in him, that starts to flow through his veins. Uh, Jesus is angry. He's agitated at something or someone, and it's righteous. It's right. The question is, well, who? What, what, What is Jesus getting all worked up for? Why is he deeply moved? Is it is he angry at Mary and Martha and their response, mourning their brother? Absolutely not. 
Is he angry in, at, at the friends? Is he agitated with the friends? Of course not. Is there weeping with him? Well, what is? Well, Jesus is fired up with a righteous anger, an agitation against sin and death. That's why Jesus is so fired up. And when he comes and sees the tomb, it's at that point it says that Jesus is deeply moved. He's agitated. He's angry. Why? Because the tomb represents death. And he's fired up. He's fired up because sin and death weren't in the original plan. He didn't create sin and death. It came into his original creation the death, the sorrow, the grief, the weeping, the tears of loss because of Adam and Eve's sin. And he's fired up. He's angry. He's agitated at sin and death because he sees the destruction it causes to his children. Therefore, the next scene of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead is the beginning, get this, is the beginning of Jesus picking a fight with sin and death. Let me explain. That phrase, deeply moved, is, is, is a word in the Greek language that we just don't have a word that describes it ap- aptly. In fact, uh, many scholars say that the, the, the root of that word is of an animal snorting in anger, right? But that would be kind of odd, right? If we put that definition in there, right? And Jesus snorted, right? You'd be like, well, that's kind of weird, right? Right, that's kind of weird. So they come with this deeply moved. Has a meaning of an animal snorting anger like a horse, like a war horse. War horse is on the battlefield. The horse understands the tension. He, he, he feels the emotion of what's about to take place, and he snorts in anger, ready to engage in the battle. This is what's taking place. Um, A number of commentaries, or a couple commentaries, kind of point this out, not a number. And two of the best ones are old, old saints, B.B. Warfield and John Calvin. And they helped me see this thing correctly because it changed the way in which I read this verse. And what I've ever heard taught on this verse. I've been a Christian for over 20 plus years and I've never heard this taught. And it was just eye-opening to me. It says this. This is how B.B. Warfield puts this. Jesus being deeply moved says this, quote, Jesus advances against death as a champion who prepares for conflict and gazing into the skeletal face of the world. He saw the reign of death everywhere. And he raged in his spirits at the effect of Adam's sin, which touched all of humanity and finds illustration in the death of his friend Lazarus. John Calvin says it this way, Jesus as the champion, the wrestler, the boxer who prepares for a contest. And therefore, we need not wonder that he again groans, snorts at the violent tyranny of death, which he had to conquer is placed before his eyes. If, if, if this was a movie scene, if someone you know, made a movie at this, it would be at this point that we'd hear one of those epic, you know, Hans Zimmer tracks would drop, right? Like from Gladiator, one of those just epic instrumentals, just dun, 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 you know, whatever, however it would be. You get the scene. Jesus walks up to the tomb. He's snorting. He's shouting. Because he knows he's about to go against the greatest enemy between you and me, or against us, and that is sin and death. That's what's taking place. That's the collision that is happening at the tomb of Lazarus. It's intense. John eleven forty one. So they took away the stone. What's that? That's the first pitch right? That's the kickoff. It has begun. And Jesus lifted his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I say this on my own account. The people standing around so that they may believe that you sent me, verse 43. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. What do we see here? We see Jesus throwing body blows to sin and death. The first blow he throws is prayer, is prayer. And that should be our first blow that we 
encounter or we throw when we're handling suffering and grief. So we get on our knees and we pray to the Father. We pray just like Jesus. He prays to the Father out loud. Secondly, the second blow he throws is his commands. It's his word. He states, Lazarus, come out. Jesus lands two bloody blows to sin and death. Are they effective? Verse 44. The man who had died came out. His hands, feet, bound with linen stripes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to him, which is another interesting thing, uh, will someone go unbind him and let him go, right? It's like... Now again, I want us to hit the pause button because we just explained this epic scene that's happening, right? Jesus going head to head with sin in death. Jesus throwing body blows through prayer, seeking his Father, through speaking his word. And then when we read this story, we just kind of read it like it's no big deal, right? Because we're looking back on it. We're like, of course Jesus raised him from the dead, because that's what Jesus does. He's the Son of God. That's what he does, right? We read the story. We know that's going to happen. But imagine you're there. You, You followed Mary. When Mary went, you were one of the mourners, and you you followed Mary, and there's Jesus at the tomb with Mary, and all of a sudden, you see the stone walked away, and there's no stinketh, right? There's there's no death. And all of a sudden, here comes Lazarus. You know, he's like hopping out like a little wrapped up, you know, energy bunny kind of looking thing, right? Can you imagine what you would have felt at that moment? I, I was trying to... Think of ways that we would be like, oh my goodness, I, uh, how, how would we respond to something like that? And of course, I come up with a, an athletic illustration, no shock there, right? But it's last year, in the Super Bowl, when the Patriots are down 21 points. Half of America turned the TV off right at halftime. Why? Because the game's over. And then what happened? If you turn it back on, you're like, the Patriots won. The Patriots won. And as it's unfolding... You're like, there's no way this is happening. This can't happen. This is unbelievable. There's no way this is happening, right? How many of you were like that last year, right? I know even even everyone was like, I can't believe this is happening. Now, that was over a football game. What we're talking about is a dead man walking out of a tomb after four days, utterly astonished. What would your reaction been if you were there? You see him hopping out of the tomb, stunned. Can't believe, I think the majority of people were stunned, and that's why Jesus said, hey, will someone please go unbind him? Because if no one does, he's going to suffocate and die again. It's like, hurry up, guys. Someone, please. But they're like stunned, because this dead man comes hopping out. And then all of a sudden, there's utter joy. Well, there's utter grief before, pain. There's crying because Lazarus is no longer with us now. All of a sudden, those tears of sorrow became tears of joy for everyone there. Except for who? Lazarus, right? You're like, what are you talking about, Aaron? Think about it. Lazarus was in heaven with Jesus hanging out. With Jesus, with, with God the Father hanging out in heaven. Everything's perfect. No sin, no death. His like eyes have been all, well, look at that. Well, look at that. And then there's Moses. Oh, there's Joseph. Oh, man, David. Let's talk, man. Let's hang, you know. And all of a sudden, he's back at Bethany in the Middle East going, what just happened, right? <laughs> can you imagine that? I can see the conversation, you know, between God the Father and Lazarus. Like, hey, man. Oh, man, God, you're amazing. Man, all these guys. And then all of a sudden, like, a, like over a loudspeaker when you're in school, you hear Jesus start to pray to God the Father. Father. And you just hear Lazarus go, uh-oh, right? <laughs> <laughs> Lazarus, come out. And all Lazarus is like, but no! Right? And all of a sudden, he's, he's walking out of the tomb. I don't know. That's extra biblical, by the way. Don't quote me on any of that stuff. <laughs> Think about it. You mean a... Uh, what an amazing scene. What a rescue. This is what Jesus is. He is the resurrection and the life. 
The resurrection is for those that have passed and died. They, they are raised again. The, the life is for us this morning. It's an already not yet. We know the resurrection will come and there will be a day when, when if we die before Jesus comes back that, that our bodies still stay in the ground until that resurrection day and then he reunites our bodies with our spirit and all of a sudden we got resurrection bodies, no spirit, and we live in heaven. But until that day, we need to live life as though that is true. That's why Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life because we can taste and have some of that life now here on earth. What a rescue. I said this event began Jesus' confrontation with sin and death. In John 19 and John 20, Jesus knocked sin and death out for the final time. This event in John 11 begins it, but Jesus throws his final blow after sin and death throw their blows against Jesus. The whippings. The suffering he gets, the, those cursing him, his body being nailed to the cross, and then finally taking his last breath, physical death. That's all that sin and death could produce against Jesus. And what happens in John 20? Jesus throws the final blow. Jesus put to death, death, by raising himself up from the grave. And that's our hope this morning. You see, because ultimately, the the story of Lazarus is our story, is your story, is my story. We are Lazarus. Apart from Christ, we are dead in our sins and trespasses. We're in the tomb with no hope and no peace. But if we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, that he is the one that came and defeated sin and death in our place, he is the one that died on the cross for our sin, and he rose again three days later. If we believe that, repent of our sin and trust in him, then we'll be like Lazarus and walk out of that tomb alive, never to die again. So the question for you and me this morning is, do you believe this? Do you believe in Jesus as the only way, the only truth, and the only life? Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Let's pray.